Hello, and thank you for joining the podcast Emergency Minute. Your host is an emergency medicine physician who brings over 20 years of experience in healthcare. Dr. Parente will take you through some of the trending topics and challenges faced in the ER and all of healthcare. Join in the fight against misinformation. And don't forget to follow on social media at Dr. J. Parente. Now, here's your host, Dr. John Parente. All right, welcome back, everyone. How's everyone feeling? You guys getting outside, enjoying this sunshine? I think we've had unprecedented like days of sunshine for Cleveland, Ohio. And I, for one, as a guy that loves to be outside, loves to be in the pool all summer, I'm not complaining. I know a lot of y'all are complaining like, we need rain, we need rain. I'm good, I'm good, man. I'm good with my sunny days. So anyways, welcome back, Emergency Minutes, episode 11. Ironically, medical things to consider this summer. So I wanted to kind of touch over a couple different things that we want to consider this summer to stay healthy and maybe have a little fun with it as well. A little bit of disclaimer here, I'm not providing any medical advice whatsoever, just giving some helpful tips and tricks and things to stay healthy this summer. So please don't sue me, literally. need to start off the show like I do every week and thank everyone, all of the listeners for commenting, sharing, liking the posts on social media to help spread the word of Emergency Minute. Uh, it definitely takes a very a large effort from a lot of the audience to help get something like this off the ground. So I do appreciate that. All right. So what are we going to talk about first? Well, first we're going to talk about some food poisoning. Yay. So we've all been to that cookout, right? Who doesn't love a good cookout? And there's pasta salad, there's burgers, there's hot dogs, all that kind of stuff. And what happens is the pasta salad is left out. Uh, you know, grandma brings her famous pasta salad. The problem is it sits out in the heat all day and you can end up getting something called Bacillus cereus, uh, which is a really nasty bacteria. And it's pretty much present in a lot of different food types. The problem is if it's not appropriately refrigerated when preparing it, it can lead to some badness. So the longer it stays out, those bacteria are given the opportunity to multiply, especially when it's out in the sun or out in a warmer climate as opposed to the refrigerator. So what happens is you get these bacteria that at a little concentration, probably not going to bother you too much, but then they start to grow and multiply in higher numbers. And that sort of increases your risk of badness. Now, if you haven't had a chance to check out last week's show from two weeks ago, where I talk about ciguatera toxicity and scombroid, uh, which are some types of food poisoning, definitely want to check that out. The name of that episode is Hilarious Medical Things, which not so hilarious to the person that that happens to, but still very fascinating nonetheless. So what will happen with this pasta salad is it's left out too long and there you can detect an odor and it may not taste right. So I would suggest that if you are at a cookout this summer and you're like, you know what, I'm just not feeling the pasta salad, or perhaps you arrive late and you're like, I don't know how long this has been out for, you may want to skip the pasta salad because by then it may be too late and you're going to end up with some pretty nasty stuff. Now, usually it's just vomiting and diarrhea. But if there is a high enough concentration, this can lead to some pretty nasty things. Liver failure, shock, and in some cases, it can even be fatal. You can Google online right now and check, and there's like cases where it has taken out an entire family, like killed them. So the toxin is heat stable, which means it's not killed by cooking anything. So again, this is all refrigeration issues uh, because things tend to sit outside during these cookouts. And we talked about heat label versus heat stable during the last show as well. All right, so how do we diagnose this? Well, I mean, pretty much it's just a clinical diagnosis, but if you truly need to know the exact organism, then it's done by stool cultures, which usually take a couple days to come back. Antibiotics are not usually indicated unless you have some other complications such as bacteremia, which is bacteria sort of floating through the bloodstream, or if you have some sort of cardiac or neuro involvement, etc. So next time someone offers you pasta salad at that wonderful cookout, you may want to think twice about it unless you know where it's been and how long it's been there. All right, what's something else that we see very commonly in the summertime? How about tick bites? Yeah, you kind of got to be on the lookout for these. Two of the more common ones that we discussed, deer ticks and wood ticks, and then some of the more common things, or at least well-known things, would be uh, Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is not to be confused with Rocky Mountain Barking Spiders, which was the initial proposed name for high-altitude flatus expulsion, which was discovered on the last episode, Hilarious Medical Things, where we discuss how you fart more at a higher altitude, and this was an actual discovery back in 1980. So what are these things? Well, you know, this is where the tick latches on, 
And in order for you to receive treatment, you see, here's the problem. There's a lot of misconception about treatment. There's basically people see a tick and they come rushing to the emergency room and think that they need, you know, months worth of antibiotics. The reality is in order for you to have treatment or to require treatment, there's a certain set of criteria that you need. The rest of it is just exposure and you really don't need to care that much about it. So the first thing is that the tick has to be an adult deer tick if we're talking about Lyme disease. So it's important to get like appearance of the tick, size, et cetera. Now I do spend quite a bit of time making fun of people that bring weird shit to the emergency room, but this might be one of those cases where if you do happen to have a tick that you've pulled off, which we can also discuss, you definitely want to put it into a Ziploc bag and then seal that shut. And then if you're wondering if you need to be treated, you either Google it or come to the emergency department and we'll take a look at the tick. So it basically has to be on you for greater than 36 hours and the patient would have to present within 72 hours of the bite. So if you have the deer tick, it's been on you for longer than 36 hours, which I know sometimes you're not going to know because why would you know that? And then, you know, obviously you'd take it off if you thought that was the case. Uh, and you have to be there within 72 hours of the bites. Now, if these criteria are met, then a single dose of doxycycline is effective for prevention of Lyme disease. Now, that's not to be confused with treatment, which will require a longer course of antibiotics for 10 days. There are some other reasons that you can't take doxycycline. You're allergic, you're pregnant, et cetera. There are other treatments, but for the sake of this podcast, we won't dive into them. Now, how do you remove a tick? Well, it's really careful to squeeze at the closest point possible to the skin and not to squeeze so hard that you're pulling out, just squeeze to get enough traction in order to be able to pull that out. So you're trying just to kind of grab it right at the base where it's uh, entering the skin and then pull it out. And most people are going to be just fine. But if you have any concerns, like I said, you, you know, seek medical attention because I know that's something that, you know, Lyme disease is one of those things that kind of scares people. Another reasonable strategy, however, is just to wait, just kind of observe to see if you develop the classic rash. It's called a target lesion and it looks like an erythema multiform. It's uh, looks like the Target logo. So uh, if you see this, then obviously you need to be treated not just with the one dose, but with the 10-day course. If you don't get the rash, well, then it's reasonable to assume that you don't have Lyme disease. Also, Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever are very regionally appropriate based on ticks. So there's like different maps and stuff that you can Google to see like what area of the country you live in or what area of the world you live in and, you know, determine if it, it would even be possible for you to have that illness based on where you're at. Another thing that we see a lot in the summertime, the sun. And what does the sun do? It brings us joy. No, it uh, causes sunburn. That's, uh, you know, so that that's what we're going to talk about today, sunburn. Now, if you haven't listened to the podcast on medical myths, where we talk about higher SPFs, I would definitely suggest you do that. However, use sunscreen. I know it's, this is... This is uh, some really hard hitting stuff here. No, but seriously, you got to you got to use sunscreen. If you're using anything over SPF 30 or 50, you're just paying for marketing. Uh, the rest of that's garbage. Believe it or not, the best treatment for sunburn is ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. Prevention. You'd be surprised the number of patients we see that come to the emergency department with sunburn. Yes, that's a real thing. So there's really not much for us to do, which is why it's my one of my least favorite complaints in the ER. So I'm like, what, what do you want me to do? Maybe next time wear sunscreen or I don't know, get an umbrella. We really don't do anything other than recommend hydration. If you want to take an anti-inflammatory for pain, if you're able to do that, there are some topical applications out there for lotions, uh, aloe, etc. We get a lot of patients in the emergency department requesting solar cane. Quick question, do you think solar cane works better than anything else or any of the over-the-counter lotions? No, they do not. It's been studied and it's been basically equivocal. So meaning whatever you put on you, whatever you feel like you can put on your skin that makes you feel better, give it a whirl. There's really nothing that's been proven to be superior. So obviously there's the concern of skin cancer, which is the thing that nobody worries about until you have it, right? That's the thing. You're like, ah, it's not going to happen to me. And I'm is just as guilty as anyone because I'm Italian. And I have very brown skin. But just one really severe sunburn versus like multiple times of having some minor redness, like several times over several years, increases your risk of skin cancer big time compared to that just kind of long-term chronic exposure. So it is important that you, you know, take this seriously. Obviously, the other things that the sun does accelerate aging, you know, wrinkles, et cetera. I would highly recommend a good follow of one of my, my great friends, uh, Dr. Dustin Portella. You can actually find him at drdustinportella.com 
or you can follow him on just about any other social media for Dustin Portella. He's big on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. And he's a dermatologist that actually worked with me as a medical student. He's one of my top medical students I ever had in my life. And I would make sure you check him out because he's got tons of great information for skincare. He has skincare products that he recommends and he's absolute straight shooter. He's going to basically, whatever he's selling on his pages and things like that is the stuff that I'm buying. I'm going to tell you that. So anyways, just check that out. That's So that's my spiel on sunburn. All right, what's next? How about ear infections? Now, come Common misconception is that, you know, ear infection is an ear infection. Well, there's two types of ear infection. There's what's called otitis media, which is the infection of the inner ear. You can't, it, that's nothing that's coming out of the ear. That's inside the ear. Uh, and then you have otitis externa, which is swimmer's ear. That's the sort of common terminology. That's the canal, the ear canal. Now, those are two completely different things. And I know it's a really small area, so it's easy to get confused. But if you have an inner ear infection, there's no drainage. There's, well, unless you rupture your tympanic membrane, which is your eardrum, but there's nothing coming out of the ear. It's inside the ear. But swimmer's ear, extremely painful. And what happens is you get a nasty bacterial infection that is inside the ear canal. The canal starts to basically swell up and is extraordinarily painful. Now, sometimes it gets to the point where it's so bad that we can't even get the drops inside you know, the canal fully in order to treat it. And in that case, we use something called a wick, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is a wick, a little thing that looks like it should be on top of a candle. We shove it in there and then we put the eardrops inside and then it sort of works down through osmosis and gets down to the bottom and then that medicine can start to work on repairing the ear. Now, one of the things that people don't realize is a lot of those medications are not only antibiotics, but they also have a steroid in there to help with inflammation and pain. So those things can be very helpful. Now, there are some things that you can do, however, to prevent getting these uh, nasty ear infections this summer. You can try wearing earplugs, especially if you're someone that has a hard time like getting the water out of your ears. I'm sure all of you have been there where like you can swim underwater, there's no problems, but then once in a while you just get like that water in your ear and your ear kind of like feels full and you're like, what the heck? And I see people like shaking their head and like smacking their hand on the side of their head, trying to like figure out like, how am I going to get this damn thing out of there? So, you know, if you're someone that's prone to that, that's, that's where these types of infections can occur. There has been some studies looking at maybe putting in a drop of like a red wine vinegar or something like that uh, after you're out of the pool to kind of use that acidity to you know, sort of kill off the remaining bacteria that are in your ear. I think that's fine. I, I do recommend use of Q-tips, but you gotta be real careful. Obviously you don't wanna jam it in there like a friggin' screwdriver and go, you know, through your eardrum or anything like that. You have to be very gentle. And I definitely do not recommend Q-tips every single day. You'll irritate the skin, break it down, you know, increase your chance of infection, etc. It's normal to have a little bit of drainage. I mean, basically earwax is a form of sweat. So it's, you know, you, you kind of have to have a little bit of that in there. That's okay. But I would recommend every other day or every three days for just general maintenance. But yeah, treatment for swimmer's ear, you definitely want to go and get that checked out because you may need a wick. You're probably almost definitely going to need antibiotics. And then the steroid that's in the antibiotic will help with pain as well. All right, another thing we see every summer in the emergency department, poison ivy. Yes, people do come to the ER for this. And actually, I understand why. It can be maddening to just have this just intense itching, scratching, etc. So what is poison ivy? Well, obviously, it's from a plant. Uh, we call this Roos dermatitis, which is uh, from the plant name. And it basically has a certain type of oil that is secreted and you touch it on your skin, and then anywhere you touch that, it becomes basically transmissible, and that's when you get the allergic reaction. That's what this is. This is an allergic skin reaction. Now, there are some myths about its contagiousness. Everyone thinks that poison ivy is contagious. It is not. Let me say this again. Poison ivy is not contagious, but here's what I mean. If you have poison ivy on your body, you cannot spread poison ivy to me, unless if you have poison ivy and the oils from the plant still on your fingers, your hands, your body, your feet, wherever it may be, and then that part of your body that has the oils then touches me. That's it. So the wounds themselves are not contagious to other people. And, and here's the other thing to consider is, you know, so we, we get this all the time in the ER. Well, it started off on my hands, but then it started to spread to like my groin or this area or that area. And I'm like, well, I got news for you. That's because it was on your hands and then you touch that area after prior to getting the oils off of your hands. So people that think it spreads, it's just the basic, it's just the oils 
that are spreading from wherever you're touching your body. Uh, hence the joke about touching your groin. All right, moving on. So can you prevent it? Yes, to an extent. So if you're out in the woods and you're, you know, hiking and you're around and you're like, oh man, I think I may have come into contact with poison ivy. Yeah, I mean, you can come in if it's within a certain period of time, like you know, 30 minutes or 60 minutes and you really do a good rub down of soap and water and take a shower and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's going to decrease the likelihood. They do sell some over-the-counter sort of preventative medications. The one that I like the best is called Xanfel, which I do have on my Amazon storefront page. So if you ever want to figure out if you want to buy that, that's fine. I think that's a good way to prevent it. If you're in contact with it, basically you just rub this uh, lotion on there uh, after coming in from being outside, wherever the exposed area is, and then that will decrease the likelihood that you will develop poison ivy. Now, how do we treat poison ivy once it's already occurred? So the name of the game here is steroids. And I'm gonna tell you a lot of doctors do this the wrong way. So if you just go on, say, a Medrol dose pack, a Medrol dose pack, I don't even know why we prescribe these damn things anymore. It's a really low dose of steroids. And you've I'm sure you guys have had them before. Oh, it's six pills on day one and then five pills on day two and da-da-da-da, and we taper down. I don't like that for a number of reasons. Number one, it's not strong enough. Number two, why are we tapering steroids? The evidence tells us that we do not need to taper steroids unless you're going to be on steroids for a very long period of time, like two to three weeks minimum. So there's no point in tapering steroids. It has absolutely no clinical utility whatsoever. And doctors that are still doing this, it just blows my mind. So if you just do like a five-day prednisone, 60 milligrams, like is that going to help you? Yes. However, there's a rebound phenomenon, and it doesn't happen all the time, but boy, if it happens, you're not going to want to be on the receiving end of it. I can promise you that. Basically, you get steroid, or you get the uh, poison ivy, you take your five or seven days of prednisone, which is appropriate, and then all of a sudden, you get this, like, just, you feel great, everything is getting better, and then, bam, it hits you, and it's 10 times worse than the initial poison ivy. So, it's it's very nasty thing. So what I like to do and what I recommend is a shot of intramuscular Kenalog, which is a long-acting, low-dose steroid that lasts for about 10 to 14 days. However, if it's really severe, like if you're just going bananas and you have it on your face and it's on your body or if it's in your groin because you'd be surprised how often we see that, yeah, I'm probably going to add some steroids by mouth as well. What the shot does then is it not only treats the poison ivy, but it decreases the likelihood of having a bounce back rebound phenomenon. So I'll do like 60 milligrams of prednisone for a five or seven day burst on top of having an intramuscular injection of catalog. I think that's personally the best regimen. It is supported in a lot of the literature. And again, for these docs that are tapering or giving these wimpy doses of steroids for five days, please do yourself a favor and read something. All right, another thing we see in the summertime Traumarama. Yes, motorcycle season. Although a lot of the motorcycle accidents don't ever make it to the ER because they get scooped up on the side of the road with a shovel. So I think one of the misconceptions about trauma is that, oh, you must see so much more of it during the winter months because it's icy outside. Yes and no. We definitely see more of like elderly falls on the ice and things like that with like hip fractures, wrist fractures, those types of injuries in the wintertime because of obviously the the ice and, and snow and things like that, the elements. But one thing that is kind of a misconception is, well, oh, there must be a lot more car accidents. Well, yes, but here's the thing. Most people, most reasonable people anyways, in the wintertime, when you are in a car accident and you've lost control of your vehicle, you know, you're typically not moving at a very fast rate of speed, right? I mean, if you're slipping and you're sliding and there's snow and there's ice, like you're probably not going 90 miles an hour, right? I mean, you're probably going way less than you would be going if it was nice outside. So I do agree that we probably see a few more fender benders, things like that, but the majority of the accidents that occur in the summer are actually much more high speed. That's where you get your motorcycles. That's where you get people going 90 miles an hour. That's where you get two country roads that come together and for whatever reason, someone doesn't see a stoplight or a stop sign and bam, those two cars are going together 60, 70 miles an hour. And those are where you get your really, really nasty accidents. Now, of course, there's exceptions to this. Last year, there was that horrible accident on the turnpike that took out like 50 people and ended up hitting like, uh, I think four or five major hospitals ended up with patients from that accident. So there are obviously bad things that can happen in the winter time. But for the most part, winter accidents are usually fairly minor because people are going slower. And summer accidents can be pretty nasty because that's when people are out. It's sunny out and they're going, you know, 80 miles an hour or doing other things that they probably shouldn't be doing. So, you know, I think I, there's so much I could say about trauma. 
But I think my biggest thing is just, you know, be cautious, don't drink and drive, wear a helmet. You know, those are the basic things that, uh, you know, could save your life. I could do an entire podcast on trauma. And if there's interest in that, perhaps I will. But that's sort of the short version on trauma and the misconceptions with car accidents and winter versus summer. All right, another thing we see every summer, flare-ups of asthma, COPD, emphysema, which by the way, misconception, COPD is emphysema, emphysema is COPD. I'm reminded of uh, Ace Ventura, where he says, Finkel is Einhorn, Einhorn is Finkel. So basically, COPD and asthma, we see these flare-ups a lot of times in the summer. And, and, and a lot of it's, you know, certainly the allergens in the air, the heat, and, you know, we forget a lot of people don't have the luxury of having air conditioning. And so we see this a lot in the ER where these patients who are like 60, 70 years old and they're on oxygen and they're living in their, you know, trailer home or, you know, their apartment and they just don't have good air conditioning and they're just, they just get sweaty and hot and they get short of breath and it kind of flares up either their asthma or their COPD. So that's something that we see very commonly in the summertime. So my advice to you is if you have a loved one that does have either asthma or COPD, you know, check in on them, make sure they're doing okay. Ask them, hey, do you have your inhaler? You know, a lot of physicians nowadays are doing these rescue packs, which include, uh, for COPD anyways, which include like the ability to get quickly a albuterol, prednisone, and even an antibiotic like Zithromax or doxycycline, which does treat the, what we call exacerbation or the flare up of COPD. And this has been great because this is a way to keep people out of the hospital, right? Like this is something where you start to have symptoms and the physicians have basically empowered you to say, okay, I, I think my asthma or my COPD is flaring up. I'm going to start on treatment and that's going to keep me out of the emergency room and hopefully keep me out of the hospital. So I think this is a great evolution in medicine. Unfortunately, in medicine, we're so stuck in these damn paradigms and these lanes that sometimes we don't think outside the box. Like, hey, Let's give the patients the opportunity to treat themselves before they have to come to the emergency room and they're half dying. So I think this is a great thing, but check on your loved ones this summer because we do see flare-ups of breathing issues in the summer and it happens every year. All right, what's another thing we see in the summertime? Unfortunately, I have to talk about this, drowning. This is not an easy thing for me to talk about because this is something that once you lose a child to you know, drowning, this is, this is such a tragic, tragic thing. So one quick misconception about drowning, the actual word drowning does not mean death, meaning you can drown and still make it and still survive and still be a drowning victim. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people think if you drown, that means that's how you died, which is partially true. You can definitely die from drowning, but you can also live uh, after drowning. And those are, of course, the success stories. So I wanted to make sure that we kind of spelled that out, uh, although it's really just more semantics than anything. But basically, you know, this drowning, I'll, I'll tell you a story real quick. When I was on my honeymoon in Hawaii, um, there was uh, this girl, probably about 16 years old, who was in the pool. There's this giant pool at the Hyatt in Maui. And, you know, she started sort of walking out towards the center. And unfortunately, there's uh, this pool is massive. And as it goes towards the middle, uh, it goes down to like nine feet. Now, I don't know if there's any signs around there that like say that. And quite frankly, I don't think they spoke English. So I'm not sure they would have been able to interpret those signs either. But I kind of was watching from my chair and I just saw that like something was amiss. Like I don't think she or her friend knew how to swim at all. Um, so I'm there, you know, chilling out uh, at the pool on my honeymoon and she you know, goes out towards the middle and then all of a sudden I see her hand go up and then all of a sudden she is down and under the water. And I, you know, it's funny to me because I think back to that day and I'm kind of looking around and I'm like, does anybody else see this? Like, is she just goofing off or like she doesn't really know how to swim? I mean, I guess sometimes we take for granted that people who are, you know, 16 years old probably should know how to swim, but maybe not everyone does. So I'm sitting there and I look at her friend who's on the edge of the pool, but not in the pool. And she just has this like blank stare on her face. She didn't speak a word of English. So I kind of yelled to her. I'm like, hey, is she messing around or is she really under the water here? And she didn't respond. So she was drowning. That that was that was a drowning patient. So I immediately you know jumped in the pool. Thank God I've been you know, swimming literally since the age of three and uh, swam out there and, and, and picked her up out of the water and 
swam all the way back to the side of the pool and threw her on the pool and she started coughing immediately and she was okay. She was fine. But boy, that 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 can happen in a split second. And I'm, I'm obviously very thankful that I was there because there weren't a lot of people at the pool at that time. It was very early in the morning. In fact, the only reason why I was there is because there was a Browns game being played and the time of football on NFL Sunday in Hawaii is super early in the morning because of the time change. So that was the only reason why I was at the pool. I guess everything happens for a reason. So yeah, so that's an example of someone who's, who's drowned but then, you know, obviously survived. I think another misconception is that people think they will hear a struggle. People think they will hear a problem. I mean, most traumatic things that happen in life are associated with noise, commotion, etc. If you hear a gunshot, if you hear a car accident, if you hear police sirens, like, you know, when I hear people screaming in the emergency room, like, that's always my rule. Like, if somebody's running or screaming, somebody better be dying because, you know, we have a little bit of PTSD and we just automatically then go running or, you know, towards whatever is screaming or, um, you know, whatever that commotion is. So the misconception there is that drowning is often silent. Uh, we have a story of Shaq Barrett. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He is a very talented NFL player that is in his fifth season with Tampa Bay Buccaneers who unfortunately just lost his three-year-old daughter to the swimming pool this summer, or well, I should say with this last spring. This can happen to anyone, and it's 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 horrible. It's absolutely tragic. You don't hear anything because why? Because it's a three-year-old child that just fell into the pool, and if you unless you hear the water, or unless that child is skilled enough to at least like kick and struggle and try to get mouth or arms above water, like that's the only way you're going to hear anything. And remember, it doesn't take like 30 minutes for someone to die in water. It's it's literally seconds or minutes at the most. So this is a horribly tragic thing. Uh, it's one of the leading causes of death in children aged one to four years old. And they almost always occur in either swimming pools. It can be in ponds and lakes and stuff like that too, of course. But I think we get really comfortable with pools. And so, of course, you know, the recommendation is to cover your pools, especially if you're not home, dear Lord. You know, put like fences and gates have security alarms. They even have pool alarms that if something does fall into your pool that's like perceived to be a human, that will go off as well. You can connect that to your cell phone. They do recommend, CDC recommends that parents can take CPR and rescue lessons. Obviously, enrolling your children in swim lessons can be something that can be life-saving as well. Um, so this is this is just one of those horrible things that you have to talk about and you have to consider, unfortunately, Every summer we see this and, you know, we, we kind of need to know. Now, there's another thing that I want to talk about, and that's this myth of dry drowning. I just had a patient who came in last week who basically had coughed up some pond water uh, in the pool or in the pond and family had brought them in because they were like, well, they were on Google and they were like, oh my God, even though this happened like 16 hours ago, there still could be this like dry drowning phenomenon. Er, that's not true. It's not true. There's no such thing as dry drowning. So where did this come from? This came from like this, this concept that you could have laringa spasm and then like you would just like lock up and stop breathing. This, this is not true. If you're going to drown, you're going to drown and you're going to die. That That's the reality. If you're like fine 16 hours later, you're fine. Now, you can develop things like an aspiration pneumonia and things like that, or you can even get a pneumonitis. So if you get sort of water down the wrong hole, so to speak, and it gets into your lungs, or this, this could happen with food, chemicals, or anything else, you can get inflammation within your lungs. And this usually presents, you know, within a couple of days after. Now, if it's like a toxic chemical that you're using, it can happen that same day and you feel like really short of breath and everything. That's more like a pneumonitis. A lot of times we'll do an x-ray in the ER just to kind of like, I don't know, make sure we're not seeing anything else, a foreign body in there. Maybe they, the kid swallowed a plastic toy or a metal toy or something. So we do a lot of x-rays just to kind of cover the bases, but like nine times out of 10, if not more than that, those x-rays come back negative. And, and by the way, most aspirations don't require antibiotics. The body just sort of deals with it. Antibiotics are not recommended unless you actually have aspiration pneumonia, or if you're like immunocompromised, you're on chemo, you know, something along those lines. So if you think, if you're concerned at all, please bring your child to the emergency department. That's fine. I'm happy to see and tell you you don't need anything or do an x-ray and tell you you're fine. I'd much rather that than the alternative if there's any uncertainty about difficulty breathing, turning blue, things like that. But for the most part, these people that just get a little bit of water in their lungs or something, they do just fine. And if you start to develop shortness of breath, you know, coughing excessively, fevers, etc., you know, I would recommend an x-ray. Uh, sometimes that aspiration takes a couple of days to show up on an x-ray. But yeah, it's a real tragic thing to talk about drowning, but I wanted to make sure we talked about the myths of dry drowning versus just actual drowning. And then obviously drowning 
doesn't necessarily mean that you have to die. In fact, hopefully you can be saved by someone. If you want to read some uplifting stories after this uh, horrible discussion of drowning we just talked about now, I would advise you to go to Google and talk about NFL players that have saved uh, drowning victims because I, in doing the research for this show, I obviously typed in NFL players. I remember Shaq Barrett's daughter was just recently tragically lost to this. And there are innumerable stories of NFL players and coaches that did receive training and things like that and uh, ended up saving all these kids. There's just like a ton of stories out there. So really uplifting stuff, very positive. Wanted to try to end this show on a positive note. So that's all I have for this week. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. I love doing this podcast and just kind of being real with you guys, trying to connect the outside world with the medical world, which we all know is completely broken. Next week on the show, I'm going to do a Q&A. This was brought up by my, my brother, Drew. Drew, we love you, buddy. And he said that he wanted to hear like a Q&A, like someone asking me questions and then I would give answers to that. So if you have a question that you want someone to ask me, Go ahead and leave it in the comments or go to drjparente.com. You can sign up with your email and then you can email me any questions that you have and I will include it in the show. That's a promise. Until next time, peace, love, and happiness. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining us this week on Emergency Minute. Join us next time for more hard-hitting discussions on some of today's issues in healthcare. Don't forget to leave us a review on Spotify or follow on social media at Dr. J Parente.